you guys get that? That was kind of quick, huh? That was a little bit of a subliminal message we had up there for you. See all those things that were up there? Oops. Okay. Stop, look, listen. What's he up to today? Hmm. Well, after that samurai, samurai joke, easy. Jerry pulled it off, brother. <laughs> but the power of a few words, that's the title of my message today. And those of you that don't know me, I'm, I'm Jose, Pastor Jose. First time as a pastor up here, so thank you. Praise God. But the power of a few words. There's a, there's a story of this uh, railroad company. And this railroad company recognizing the growth that the railway system was having and in all the areas that it was going to and coinciding with the growth of the automobile industry decided that we need to do something for the people that are crossing these railroad tracks. Pedestrians, the loss of life, the loss of, of uh, vehicles, and the loss of our trains. We need something. We need something that we can put out in front of the railroad crossings to let people know this is a railroad crossing. So they uh, had a contest, and the winner of this contest would re receive $2,500. So the winner submitted the words, stop, look, and listen. Stop, look, and listen. Beware of trains. Stop, look, and listen. Many lives have been saved as a result of these words that people go up to the track and they say, oh, wait a minute, it's a railroad track. Let me stop, let me look, let me listen. Hear the, listen for the train, listen for the whistle. Let me not just cross without making sure there's not a train coming. How many of you know that trains weigh a lot more than our cars? So these words that paid about $833 a piece, if you do the math, $833.33 per word, $2,500, right? Am I, is my math right? These words mean nothing for the safety of those crossing if they're not obeyed, right? I mean, unless the people stop, look, and listen, they mean nothing. They're just words. I mean, what value does the word stop have if we don't stop when we should? What protection does the word look offer if we don't take the time to look? And what help is the word listen if we don't take the time to listen? They're useless words if they're not obeyed. I'd like to offer you three more important words. I mean, if you look at words that, that are bunched together, like faith, hope, and love. How many of you remember stop, drop, and roll? What's that for? Fire, right? Remember it as a kid going, growing up in school, right? You get on a, catch a fire, stop, drop, and roll. When we read the Bible, we hear words like faith, hope, and love. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Words that are put together in threes, right? But um, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to read God's Word. Looking on to Jesus. The power of a few words. Just remember that. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says that looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, looking on to Jesus. Three words. These are words of salvation, encouragement, and direction. Salvation, encouragement, and direction. Looking on to Jesus. I want, I want that to stay in the, just in the... You know, if we take the stop, look, and listen. Let's stop the racing of our mind and the things that we're thinking about, like lunch and and all these other things that we have going on later. Let's stop. Let those things go away. Let's look. Let's look onto Jesus this morning. And let's listen to what the Spirit of God is telling us today. He's got a message for you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Father. We pray that your Spirit will just minister to each and every person here today, Father. That we would just be 
in love with you as we walk out of here today, encouraged, Father, and in a deeper understanding of your love for us, Father. So we just thank you, Father, that, that you use us today, Father, for your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Looking on to Jesus. If we look on to Jesus, it means having eyes. It's having eyes for no one but Jesus. When we look on to something, it's different than looking on to something. It's looking deeper. It's looking past everything else and looking on to Jesus. Eyes for him only. When we look onto Jesus and we fix our eyes on him and we look away from all other distractions, we give him a gaze with undivided attention. Nothing else but Jesus. And that's what I want to try to focus on this morning. If you could just, for the next few, mi- you know, few moments, if, if you could just focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. You know, there's a worship song that says, Open the eyes of my heart that I may see. See you high and lifted up. Not with your eyes, but with your heart. Seeing the Lord lifted up. The work of the cross is sufficient for our salvation. It's a definite, definite work. I'm having a Marco Rubio moment. You see that water? <laughs> Sorry. I did that on purpose because it was funny. <laughs> okay. The work of the cross is definite. It's a, it's a finished work. And it's only through Jesus that we can come to the Father and have our sins forgiven. Looking on to Jesus. But again, these are just words if they're not followed. If we look on, if we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking on to Jesus, and we don't follow these words, they're just words. It's just like any other word that we read in the Bible, and we just pass by and not, we don't let it penetrate us and see the importance behind it. So I'm going to share with you some scripture today that's going to hopefully enlighten you to what looking on to Jesus is really all about. Jesus modeled it for us. He looked at nothing but the Father. Jesus looked at nothing but the Father. As a matter of fact, he said, I am about my Father's business. He said to them in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, he says, And he said to them, Why do you seek me? Don't you know that I must be about my Father's business? Jesus is focused. He's determined. And he has a mission and a purpose as to why he came to earth. To save to seek, save those that are lost. He, he was about his father's business. And being about his father's business was to finish that purpose for which he, which he came. Nothing could stop him from fulfilling what he came to do. So Jesus offers salvation. When we look onto Jesus, he offers salvation. That's the, that's the work on the cross. He offers salvation. So... Here in, in, in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, this is the children of Israel, okay? But Jesus is giving us an illustration from an Old Testament verse. And he says, as, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son. Jesus, like I said, used an Old Testament verse here. We find that in Numbers chapter 21, beginning in verse 4. It says, then they, this is the children of Israel, okay? These are the they. 
they, they, they were journey, they, they were on a journey, right? How many, how many of you know that there were 40 years on this journey? A place that was only maybe 11 days away, but they, they traveled round the mountain for 40 years, okay? So it says that then they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to, to go around the land of Edom. And the souls of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and there is no water. And our souls loathe this worthless bread. In other words, our souls detest this worthless bread. That's what they're saying. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we, we messed up. We sinned against God and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us, please. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and he put it on a pole and so it was. If the serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. In the Amplified, let's look at verse 9. It says, And Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And if the serpent had bitten any man, when he looked to the serpent of bronze, attentively, expectantly, and with a steady, absorbing gaze, he lived. When we look unto Jesus, this is the kind of look that we are to give Jesus. Attentively, expectantly, and a steady, absorbing gaze, we're to look at the Lord. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's what Jesus is saying. So we see that looking brought healing. Looking onto Jesus brought healing. Looking onto the serpent brought healing. We see this brass serpent today on a pole all the time. You know where? Every time you see an ambulance, every time you see a hospital sign, it's a symbol, an indication of a place where healing, listen to me, a place where healing can take place. A place where healing can take place. When we look on the cross, we have one on each side of the auditorium. We see a symbol of what could take place. Remember I said that the work on the cross is a definite work. There's no if, ands, or buts. It's, it's a definite work. It's a finished work. We see the serpent on the pole represented in the ambulances and in the hospitals and stuff. There's no guarantee that healing will take place. It can. There was this man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus said to him, Technology. George. <laughs> oh, I lost my place. Yeah, I know, but then if I if I don't do it here, I lose my place. So where was I? What verse? Okay. So Nicodemus Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
cannot enter the kingdom of God. That, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You with me so far? Nicodemus was looking. He was searching. It says that he came by night, and he said that we, we, he didn't say I only, we. He was a representative of those that were searching. We know that you are sent by God. Because no one could do these things unless God is with them. So we see that Nicodemus was maybe a closet disciple. He was searching. He knew that Jesus was a source of eternal life. But he got stumped when Jesus said, you must be born again. And he, he thought to himself, how, how can a man go into his mother's womb a second time? What is it that God is saying there? But we see also that the important thing is that he came. He knew where to go. Even if he came at night, even if he came, you know, under the cover of night, covert operation, he still came. Because he came to the source. He knew who was the source of eternal life. Many of us today came here today because we know where the source is. We know where the source of eternal life is. You have to be born again. And how can a man be born again when he is old? Hmm. That word again can be translated above. A person needs to be born from above. It's a second birth. It's a second birth. It's the new birth plan. I call it the 3NAAC plan. 3NAAC. You've heard of the WACP and the ARP and whatever those things are. 3NAAC. <laughs> Three, Three nails and a cross plan. Three nails and a cross plan. I know, it was fun. Whoever been bitten by the fire serpent upon repenting and looking unto him will be saved. The message translation I think is really powerful of John 3, of John chapter 3. It says, No one has ever gone into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence. The Son of Man, in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe. So people could have something to see and then believe. It is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. What do we do when we worship God? Don't we lift Him up? Don't we exalt Him? Don't we celebrate His goodness? When Jesus went up on the cross, He was lifted up, right? For the sins of everyone. And it says, And everyone who looked upon Him trusting and expectant will gain real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave His Son, His one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in Him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending His Son merely to point an accusing finger. God didn't send His Son to be an accuser. telling the world how bad it was. He came to help. Turn to someone and say, Jesus came to help. He came to help me. He came to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in Him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in Him has long 
since been judged. He's been under the death sentence without even knowing it. And why? Why is that? Because of the person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when they were introduced to Him. One of my biggest fears is in sharing the gospel that the person doesn't receive it. I, I, I'm like, what do you mean? Let me, give me a do-over. Let me explain it to you again. This is important. When we look unto Jesus, we look unto Him and we receive encouragement. We look unto Jesus, we receive encouragement. Now you're going to ask me, what do all these verses that I have to share with you have to do with this? But God showed me something and I'm going to share it with you this morning. I think it's pretty powerful. So this is the woman caught in adultery. You know the story, right? You know, every, everyone knows the story. And if you don't know the story, you've heard of you know, don't throw stones and all this other stuff, right? So we pick it up here where Jesus says, or where it says, so when they continued asking him, this is the religious leaders, they were drilling him. They were trying to trap Jesus. They were trying to catch him in a trap. So they continued asking him, and he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he, stood, he, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground again. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one. This, this is pretty important here. Beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Beginning with the oldest, even to the youngest. I think it's important that we recognize that because you know what? We look to our elders for an example, right? We look to our elders for guidance and for leadership and for an example to follow. And here are the oldest ones. Maybe living, they have lived longer, obviously, because they're older. Their conscience was full of a lot of stuff they've done down the line in their life, saying, you know, he's right. If I'm without sin, I could throw this stone, but, man, just off the top of my head, I have all these things that came into mind, so lay the stone down. And those that were watching from the oldest to the youngest, did the same thing and, and left. Okay? And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw that no one, no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Amen? You see, Jesus understands. He said to the woman, Where are your accusers? There are none, she said. I mean, she, I mean, in your mind's eye picture this. She was probably half-dressed, right? She was ripped out of the situation she was in and brought before Jesus because these, these religious people, they wanted to trap Jesus and they wanted to use this woman as an example. They ripped her, maybe covered up partially. They looked down on her. But Jesus bent down. He bent down to her level. They're looking down on her. And Jesus said, I'm not going to look down on you. I'm going to come down to your level. Instead of making her feel like trash, he put himself on her level. Someone's hearing this. He put himself down on her level. His level. Your level, my level, he came and met us where we're at. I mean, what a picture of salvation for us to see here. What a picture of salvation. Jesus came down to our level, our level, our level, took our place. 
was punished for our transgressions, for the whole world. He didn't come pointing a finger. He came on a mission. Jesus said to her, I don't condemn you. We also should demonstrate the same character. Love the sinner. Love the sinner. Meet them where they're at. Reach the lost at any cost because souls last forever. Seeing, in Hebrews chapter 4, it says that seeing that, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let us therefore come boldly, say boldly. Looking on to Jesus, we can look boldly to Jesus, right? Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Mercy and grace, they're separate things, guys. It's two different things, the mercy and the grace. The mercy, withholding the punishment. Jesus took it. Mercy is withholding what we deserve. <clears throat> grace, giving us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve what God has given us. But He's a giving God. He gave His only Son. He loves us. It's his nature to give. God is a giver. You can't outgive God. He said, where sin is, his grace abounds even more. God's a giver. Then there's Peter. I love Peter. I mean, I could relate to Peter. I've had open mouth and soot foot, and soot foot a bunch of times in my life. I could relate to Peter. And we'll pick this up in Matthew chapter 14. It says, so he said, come. This is Peter and the disciples after they had witnessed the miracle and 5,000 were fed with just a few fish and, lo and loaves of bread. And this incredible miracle had happened. And Jesus said to the disciples, go to the other side. He had commanded them to go. And in the midst of this Traveling to the other side, they encountered a storm. And, and they were afraid. And Jesus comes along walking on the water. So we pick it up in verse 14 where he says, So he said, Come. Peter had asked, and Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked in the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, it was loud, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And he said to him, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got in the boat, the wind ceased. And then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. As if all the other things that the Son of God had done. Truly, this time you're the Son of God. It's amazing. We would have done the same thing, so don't be pointing fingers. We would have done the same thing. Okay? When Peter cried, called out to Jesus, he saved him. He, 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 got him, he got him out of the sinking water. But, Jesus didn't lean into Peter. He didn't say, Le Peter, how long have you been with me? When are you going to get this, buddy? Then he said, oh, ye of little faith. He didn't say, oh, you have no faith. He said, ye of little faith. Can I share something with you? I believe that it was little faith that kept him from going all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. Little faith started to sink. Just enough faith that gave Jesus a grip on him. Think about that. Little faith. How many of us have little faith? God could work with that still 
okay? God can still work with little faith. It's when we have no faith. What am I supposed to do? They're not believing in me. I see two things that stand out to me from this familiar, these two familiar texts that we've read, the woman caught in adultery and Peter walking on the water. Two things that stand out to me is that, one, Jesus asked a question to each of them. Listen to me. Jesus asked a question. He said to the woman, where are your accusers? He said to Peter, why did you doubt? The difference is the woman answered and Peter didn't. Think about that for a second. The woman answered, but Peter didn't. There's no account that Peter said, oh, I was scared, Lord. Oh, you know, uh, I, I, you know I don't know. I, I, was, I got worried, you know. I, I finally found myself, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? He didn't. He didn't say anything. And the second thing that I noticed is, that the disciples were in a storm just like this woman was in a storm. The, the woman caught in adultery was in no easier of a storm than the disciples were, figuratively. But she, was, she had life hanging in the balance, right? But Jesus calmed the storm for both of them with a gentle command. Jesus got up and said, what? Throw the first stone if you're without sin. He went back down and started doing his thing. Jesus said to Peter, Hey, you have a little faith. He calmed, he got in the boat and the storm calmed, right? We're going to pick up this story towards the end of John chapter 21. And you find it, just follow me along. I don't have the numbers. So the third time that Jesus appears to the disciples, they had gone back to the family business. Peter said, I'm going to go fishing. And then the rest, some of the other disciples said, well, we're going to go with you. So they went back to the family business. But I'm going to show you something here. After Jesus had seen, after the disciple that Jesus loved, John, said, it's the Lord. Peter put on his clothes. He swam to the shore. They dragged the, the, the fish onto the shore. And after they had ate breakfast, the Lord asked Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. You know, a while back, um, the Lord showed me something. Where three times he says, feed my lamb, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep, tend to my sheep. A lamb is a baby sheep, right? There's some lambs over there being tend to right now in the, in the life center. I'm just saying, feed my lambs. So the second time, he said to him, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, tend to my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter answered him this time. He answered him for every time that he denied him, right? When God asks you a question, give him an answer. He knows the answer anyways because he knows all things. When God asked Adam, Adam, where are you? you? Know the story? After they had sinned, disobeyed the Lord, found themselves naked, they hid from the Lord. 
And God asked him, where are you? He already knew where he was. Let me say that God already knew what he had did. He knew it was hiding. But not only that, he knew what he was hiding. So who are we kidding? Now, are we going to hear an audible, audible voice from God saying, uh, Jose, where are you? That still small voice, we feel it in our spirit. It says, where are you? What are you doing? Can you invite me here? That still small voice, you know what it is. You feel it. The disciples went back to the family business. But Jesus being about the Father's business restored them back to the Father's business. He, re he restored Peter and restored the disciples back into the family business. Don't fault them. They had put all their eggs in this basket. They said, this is what we're going to follow. We, we believe in you, Jesus. We sold out to you. And this is what we're going to do. And they seen their Lord crucified and buried and they scattered. What, what were they supposed to do? Go back to what they used to do, right? But Jesus restored them. He restored them back into the family practice, the family business. Jesus said, why do you seek me? I'm about my father's business. And this is what he restored the disciples back to, the family business. I'm going to share a story with you. And we're going to close here pretty soon. Okay? I, I love stories because stories paint a picture in my mind's eye of something that, that comes to life for me. So if you want to, I'm not going to make you do it, but if you want to, you know, just kind of close your eyes. Don't fall asleep on me. I see some of you already there <laughs> nodding off. And I, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look over there. Just saying. I know you're praying. <laughs> Lord, help this man up there. <laughs> I know. But there was a preacher who, while traveling on a train, noticed this young boy, and he, and he looked really, really, really nervous. He was anxious. Looking out the window, just fidgety. He couldn't find peace. He just looked anxious. So the preacher felt compelled to go over to where the boy was. And he said, excuse me, son, I couldn't help but notice that you look a little nervous. Is there anything I could do to help? The boy said, do I look like I need any help? You ever get that from a kid? I'm fine. Yeah, right. So the preacher said, well, listen, you know, you remind me of a boy I used to know 25 years ago. I knew this boy that, that reminded me of you right now because he, he too was traveling on a train and he looked just as nervous as you do. And I want to help you. Why are you nervous? So the boy said, well, listen, I'm on my way back home because I had run away from home and I'm on my way back. Oh, okay. So why are you, why are you nervous? He says, well, it's a long story. The preacher says, I'd like to hear this story. Share with me why you ran away from home. He said, okay. Some months ago, I had a fight with my father, and I taped a note on the refrigerator and said, I'm leaving and I'm never coming back. So the father, so, so I left. And the preacher said, oh, okay. So, are you traveling back home? He says, yeah, I am. He says, great, you changed your mind. So that never was just a few months. He says, yeah, I'm on my way, but, but there's more. He says, well, sh share with me. Wh what's the story? What happened? He says, my father was trying to be controlling. He didn't allow me to stay out late with the rest of my friends and kind of do my own thing. So I got mad and I, and, I, and I left. So the preacher said, well, tell me about your dad. What kind of man was he or is he? 
And the, and, the, and the boy said, my dad's a good man. You know, he takes the time after work to do homework with me. He takes the time to play catch with me. He never misses any of my baseball games in, at Little League. He, he's a pretty good dad. He even prays with me at night by my bed. And the reason I'm nervous is because I'm afraid that he won't receive me back. I, I know I hurt him. I know I said bad things that I'm never going to come back and I hate him. So, is that it? The preacher said, he says, no, there's more. A week ago, I wrote them a letter saying I, I wanted to come home. And I wrote in the letter that as the train passes the front yard, would he place a red and white rag on the limbs of the tree in the front yard? And if I see the red and white rag, I'll stop and get off at the next station. If I don't see the wet and red and white rag, I'll keep going. I don't know where, but I'll just keep going. And I'm afraid to look. What if there's none? And the preacher said, I'll tell you what, son, I'll look for you. Why don't you just close your eyes, just relax, and I'll look for you. So the boy kept asking, are we getting there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Is the train getting there? Do you see the rag? The preacher says, we're getting there, we're getting there. Yep, yep, we're, we're there. I see the tree. There's not a red and white rag on the tree. There's hundreds of them. I think your dad wants you to come home. I think your dad wants you to come home. I think that he just didn't put one because what if the wind knocked it off and you didn't see it? What if somebody needed to blow their nose, they came by and grabbed that thing and just took it? He loaded the tree with red and white rags. I want you to know, I want you to come home. I love you. Nothing you could do could ever separate you from me. Is this a picture of the prodigal? Yeah, you see this story? But this is a picture of what God, how much God loves you. How much God loves you, how much he wants you to come back to him. How much he wants to let you know that if you look unto me, if you look unto me, I'll restore everything. If you look unto me, I'll make things right. I didn't come to accuse the world, I came to save the world. I came to save this lost and dying world. Would you close your eyes for a moment? This time I'm asking everybody across this auditorium, just close your eyes. Look on to Jesus. If you look with your eyes, you're not going to see him. If you look with your eyes, you're not going to see him. If you stop looking with your eyes and look at him with your heart, you'll find him. You'll find him. You'll see him. There's a song that says, um, I wish we had it, but it says if Jesus is standing there, arms lifted up, shining in his glory, his eyes full of tears, knowing that it's you he's thinking of. Is there any way you can say no to this man? So across this auditorium right now, I'm asking you a question. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us, none of us can throw a stone. We're all sinners. We're all condemned to die. And Jesus saved, Jesus saved us. If you're here today and you don't know the saving love that the Lord offers, if you're visiting here today, maybe you've been coming for a while, maybe you've received the Lord before.
and you know what? It went back to doing whatever you were doing. You went back to the family business. Jesus wants to let you know. He wants to restore you. If you just look on to him, look on to Jesus and be restored. Don't leave the same way you came. So I'm going to ask you a question. If you want to know that you know that you know that your sins are forgiven and that you have a creator who loves you with all of his life, he gave his son for you and is waiting there with a tree full of rags saying, come home. If that's you here today, raise your hand. Raise your hand high. Raise it proudly. Lift up Jesus right now. Lift it high. I see those hands. I see those hands here on the left. God bless you. The gentleman way in the back. God bless you. The gentleman right here. I, God bless you. I see that hand. This hand up here. I see those hands in the back. On the top. I see that hand. God bless you. Stand up. If you raised your hand, stand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise you I'm not going to embarrass you. Jesus said that he went up to the cross despising the shame for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. This is the joy that was set before him that souls will come to the saving knowledge of who he is. This is why. This is why. I'm going to ask you to take an even bolder step right now. Come to the cross. Come to the cross right here. Come. Don't delay. Come. Come to the cross. All you, that, all you that raise your hand, come to the cross. Come to the cross. Come to the cross. If you're here thinking, I should have lifted my hand, come to the cross. If you're thinking that should be me up there, come to the cross. Don't let another day go by without you making this declaration of faith. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation today. Today, all things are made new in the lives of people. All right, I want everybody to stand. Let's all stand together. Let's stretch out our arms in faith. Our right hand. Let's stretch it out in faith as we pray over these, these souls right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for receiving us today. We thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And Father, we stand here in faith believing that we could receive this everlasting life that you offer through Jesus Christ by faith. Cleanse us, make us new, that mark this day that my life will never be the same again. I praise you, Lord. I thank you in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you guys. Come here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. worry about your stuff. Your stuff will be here when it comes back. There you go. All righty. Hey, listen. Does anyone need prayer? Does anybody need a fresh touch of God, a believing hand, a comforting hug? Then come up to, come up to the front. Come up to the front. Our ministering elders are right here. If you need healing, if you need uh, direction, Guidance, come up to the front. Our elders are up here. Don't, don't leave. Don't leave. Come up to the front. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.